conversation, yeah. Are you going to be translating Very here? Good. And he's going to use this little muzzle here to make it a little bit more quiet. Great. Well, this, thank uh, you. Thank muzzle you for doing lines. that. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's not supposed to happen. Yes. But, but we, um, uh, we'll get started at 7 here with, uh, with Alan's um, time. But let me just take some... Uh, we, we got to talk about so many different we, we started chasing a bunch of rabbits during that time. <laughs> One thing we didn't do was just take out some prayer requests. So um, I want to be able to circulate these two guys every week. Say, hey, be praying for your brothers that are in this, in this yeah. cohort with you. So let's just share some things that might, you might need uh, some prayer for this week. Uh, and I'll be sure to get these out to you guys to be praying for each other. So what are some areas you might need prayer? This one is Can I be selfish and ask first? Yeah, go first. <laughs> Um, I, I, I'm starting a new project, uh, you know, a personal project. You might know about that. My, my, I'm self-employed now, and I really want to do this project and ministry too. And I'm praying that God will show me the way that I can do it in a way that I can be a blessing for you know churches, and, uh, and I can still make it some sustainable. Yeah. Okay. And this project is, you want to explain the project? So. Yeah, I, I, I do a lot of marketing, digital marketing, uh, video production, and um, I have worked with a couple of churches already building their websites, and uh, I see there's a lot of future, but there's not a lot of funding. And unfortunately, that's, a, that's something that it, it gets kind of expensive. And uh, with Anderson Baptist, we, we, we were able to do good job they we started working something we didn't expect it to be that way but it worked greatly and uh, I think God it's uh, leading me that way and I don't I haven't figured out yet how I'm gonna make a ministry of that because I know it's a, it's hard to work with churches because the churches I want to help are small churches if they weren't small then they would have their own resources mm -hmm. um, and um, it's a challenge yeah and, and Hector is um um, if you if you don't look if, if you guys know people that need some media work then pass them Hector's name, um, and you can go look at Anderson's website and the video work that's on there. That's excellent work. Um, and so what I would like is to figure out a way the association can work with Hector's. So Y'all can be praying for that as well. Over fifty percent of the church in the association have no website, no web presence whatsoever, and that's a, that's an issue in today's uh, culture. And, and and they're wondering why they're not growing, why they're not connecting with the, yeah. the millennials out there. Right? Yeah. No, no, no young people are visiting our church. And, mm -hmm. and, and, or that's half our churches have no website. Probably of the half that do, at least half of those have really bad websites. Yeah. <laughs> where you can't, where the times aren't even on anywhere in the web. You, you can't find the times. I've actually called pastors and said, you know, I, I would like to visit your church this Sunday, but I can't figure out what time your service meets. It's not on your website. What do you mean it's not on our website? You know? mm -hmm. And so... They're bad websites as well. So Hector, you know, if the association can figure out a way to get Hector um, where it can help him, where he can do these projects, but also it helps our churches, I'd love to figure that out. And, and, you know, I, I have a vision, and uh, I know at certain points it's going to be more than Hector. I, I love when people pray for me, but it's it's a project, and I think it's um, I vision a day where there's going to be like, hey, let's help this ministry, and there's going to be multi-black hectares, you know, everywhere, helping other churches. And um, that's the, because, you know. Yeah. You're right. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? Luis is, uh, wife is cuatro meses, four months pregnant. Wow. So, uh, this is his fourth. Felicidades. Uh, his fourth child? Yeah. And he was telling me his schedule. Uh, he's uh, busy almost every day, every night. So he really doesn't want to get in balance in his time. Kind of. mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, What's his wife's name? What's his name? Rosa. 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 I'm my mom's name. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's one of my favorite clothes. Well, I've changed positions at work. I've been a senior database administrator for like six years. And I've uh, got people that are more high level than I that I've worked with. And uh, we kind of had a reduction of work. Uh, I kind of saw it happening. Of course, my background's in development anyway. So I've gone back into the development side. So it's different. I've got to get back into it. It's been about 12 or 15 years since I've actually been on that side of it. 
side of it, but it's kind of like another year. In a sense, it's almost like a bicep that wants to get back on it. You know, it's a riding bicep. Is this is all that this is IT work? Yeah, we all have Oracle databases, and I've got an Oracle database and an administrator and a SQL server one, but, but we mainly do Oracle work, and so I'm doing it all on the Oracle side now. Uh, it's different, I've got to get used to it, and I got a lot of stuff to learn. <coughs> and I guess my foot. It's getting better, but I wish it would just hurry up and just heal up so I don't have to work all day and go back to wear shoes. It'll still be probably a month when that, after that happens before I can actually start walking. I definitely understand with the job change. My company got bought a few months ago, and uh, my job I expected to hear today uh, when I would be leaving and that kind of stuff. And for me, it's okay because I'm going to retire. But probably close to half the company, uh, about a quarter of them are going to go, and they're all excited. The other quarter uh, may end up being asked to leave, and they're not all that excited because they don't know what they're going to do. So there's a lot of turmoil, a lot of change, a lot of uh, a lot of opportunities. I think I talked to two people before I even got into the building this morning. You got an opportunity to minister to my yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We are prepared for my wife. She starts working as a school nurse tomorrow. She's very anxious about that. The, kid, the kids show up tomorrow at uh, Sam Rayburn. Oh, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. 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 Eyes dotted and T's crossed yeah, because I think they said the Bryan Independent School District gets 20 requests for subpoenas every week because of how many fights are on the school system. That's because of compensation. Oh, don't get me started. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because you, you hush. Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> so, anyway, pray for her. She's gonna. She's really anxious about starting tomorrow. And she struggles with anxiety anyway. So, let's pray God would just really give her peace and transcends understanding. <laughs> All right. Let's pray for the school districts uh, as a whole. Um, we hear about not everything, so we only get bits and pieces. The school district is in dire need of prayer. Very, very serious when I say that. So, I'm on several boards with uh, that involved with the school district. So, I can tell you. Uh, and it's not all bad. It's not all bad. Uh, there's some good things going on. There's also some things that need to be addressed. And the longer we set back, it's no longer a question of if it's going to happen. It's when it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, they had to deal downtown last night and they, we left it up to the teachers and administration for the school district uh, during prayer at that. Uh, but uh, our city as a whole, dis uh, school district, uh, yeah, we're, we're, in a, we're in a place that's not so nice to be. So, but God can fix it. No uh, you, I guess pray for me. Um, where I just, you know, I've changed. I changed jobs. Well, I, if you count working from, I worked for myself for about six months, and then I took a job for two months, maybe that wasn't that great. And so now I've been at the job that I'm at now for five months I think so anyway you know I've changed jobs I guess three times if you count working for myself in the last year um, my wife is back I mean she's been working for three years now you know since our youngest kid went to school and uh, uh, her job is going pretty good or whatever but I mean you know we're just kind of we're not making enough money to break even you know just almost and uh, I, mean, I was working a part-time job um, well, until like two weeks ago, you know, I quit because of time. So either, you know, you can just pray for, uh, you know, the Lord to do what he says that he'll do with finances. And then, uh, 
you know, just pray for good use of my time. I guess that's selfish. The time thing is selfish maybe for me, but the rest of it, you know, for my whole, because I got eight people that live in my house, so, you know, money, money is an issue. Yeah. All right. Well, let me just, we're already getting past seven here, and I don't want to eat into Alan's time, so let me just say a quick word of prayer. Just, um, I won't cover all these. The Lord knows them, but I'll share these with you this week. Let me just pray for the rest of our time tonight, and we'll lift up this time with Alan to the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, and Lord, your grace um, that you shower upon us every day is um, so undeserved, and Lord, we recognize that um, they even be able to come right now and to, to speak to you um, is an amazing it's an amazing thing, Lord, that, uh, that Jesus made a way um, that our high priest has gone before us and that we can now come to the throne of grace with confidence. Lord, there's a variety of requests here, as you know. And Father, we just ask that you would uh, meet the needs that, are, that have been mentioned. Lord, uh, encourage those who need encouragement. Father, I thank you for the lively discussion we had tonight from, from Genesis 1 and 2. And, Lord, help us just to embrace your word, to accept your word, and to, to believe in your word, and to, to rest in it. Um, and Father, help us to be people who can share it, and uh, Lord, as we move forward through this process, to be people who can preach it well. So Father, I pray that you would just be at this time now, as Alan shares with us, uh, just so, uh, the insight that you've given him and you put in his heart about the church. Father, we thank you for... Um, uh, for this amazing thing called the church, uh, where we're not left with uh, with cluelessness in regards to how you want the church to be structured and to be run, your word is sufficient for us when it comes to how we are to do church. So God, help us just to rest in your word. And I pray now that you be at this time and that you uh, that you be glorified and we be good stewards of the time that we have. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm gonna. Turn it over to Alan here, and um, uh, some of you guys know Alan, and some of you don't. So I'll let him introduce himself real quick, and just you, the time is yours. And sure. We usually wrap up around eight. Okay. Um, I'm Alan Duty. I'm married to Kendra for 15 years. Have three kids: a, a eighth grader, sixth grader, and a fourth grader. Um, brief backstory, I grew up in the United Methodist Church in Dallas, um, was not a believer, came to college at Texas A&M, and I had three Christian roommates who uh, showed me uh, what, what true belief and true repentance looked like. Um, so through them and through the ministry of a local church here in town, I came to faith in Christ my freshman year. And uh, I was a business major. I was planning on going to the business world, and um, I came to college to get a business degree and meet girls. So after I came to Christ, that all changed. And um, so I had an internship over the summer with a uh, public relations company in Dallas. And um, I really enjoyed that. But uh, all I could think about, what was on my heart and mind, was teaching in the church and um, being a leader in the church. And so started to explore a potential calling just privately. And in the fall of my sophomore year, uh, I had someone pull me aside and, and tell me that they thought that I might have a calling on my life to do vocational ministry. And so that was really all I needed um, to, to kind of push me in that direction. So I just began thinking that way and kind of organizing my life that way. My wife and I got married uh, after we graduated from A&M. Um, we moved to Charlotte, North Carolina for a year and a half and we worked in the business world there. And then I was called back to College Station in 2005 where I served as the college and youth pastor at Living Hope Baptist Church for four years. And during that fourth year, uh, they asked me to lead a new church plant so that became New Life Baptist Church. We launched in March of 2009, so we're a little over 10 years old now, and our facility is right across the street. So <laughs> been there for, for a little over six years now. So that's a, that's a little bit about me. Um, Steve has invited me to come teach, and I'm, I'm really happy to do so as a, a practitioner. I hope I can share some, some uh, wisdom that I've gotten um, through, uh, through good decisions and bad decisions um, along the way. And um, I, I think it's probably important to say that, uh, you know, some of the most formative things for me um, when I was, after I became a believer, 
Uh, one of the most formative things for me was Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. I still have my original copy. It doesn't look like this anymore. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, when I read this book, uh, look at that, Forward by Josh Harris. There you go. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, when I read this book, it was, uh, was life changing for me. It was something that, uh, that I felt like as I studied the scripture, it resonated with me. And I thought, this is, this is it. You know, this is really the best summary of the scripture's teaching that I had read. Um, to that point. And so that was super formative for me. Um, I got introduced to Mark um, maybe, I don't know, 2008 or nine. And uh, we've had a relationship since then. So um, he's, he, no one has been more influential on my, my theology and my ministry than, than Mark. And I'm really grateful for him. Uh, so Steve asked me to come in and, 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 and kind of organize three weeks for you guys. And so the way that I'm going to break it down is as follows. Tonight, we're going to talk about a biblical understanding of the church, okay, and try to get that, that situated first, because that is, that's the most important thing. Um, everything else basically flows from that. Next week, we're going to talk about a biblical understanding of church governance so how should the church be led? By whom should it be led? And, and in what ways should it be led? So we're going to talk about that next week. And then last, uh, we're going to talk about a biblical understanding of church membership in that third week. And so you guys are getting into some of those questions even as I walked in. And that's, those are great questions. These, these topics are so closely tied together and interrelated that there's going to be plenty of overlap. Um, but I think that's going to just help you learn as you connect the dots from church membership to the church to church governance and, and back to those other categories again. So my hope for you guys is that whether you end up uh, planting a church, um, which probably just only a few of you will, there's just not many people that end up planting, so it's a, it's a small percentage. Uh, whether you end up pastoring a church, there's a larger percentage of, of people that end up doing that. Or whether you end up as a lay leader in the church, whether as an elder or a deacon or a staff member, um, my hope is that you will be helped um, by these three weeks um, by your time spent here. And my real hope is that you guys would not just listen to me talk and agree with the things that I say. I mean, I, I'm hopeful that you'll agree <laughs> that these things are biblical, um, but you have to do more than agree. You have to know this stuff. And you have to do more than know this stuff. You have to be convicted about it. Because at the end of the day, um, what I'm going to share with you is not strategies and methods. You know, we're not, we're not talking about like, here's where you should plant your church and here's the kind of website that you should have, even though those things are important. You know, like Steve said, you got, it's the 21st century, man. You got to have a website. But we're not talking about those kinds of things. We're talking about um, biblically understanding and applying the scriptures to the local church. And so that changes everything. So we're not really talking about strategies and methods, okay? So um, what I wanna do is, is walk you guys through a bunch of different categories tonight. And this is, this is a lot of the same stuff that we walk through in our church membership process at New Life. And so this is not kind of stuff that I like had to invent specifically for you guys. It's gonna take a little bit different feel tonight. But uh, this is stuff that we teach um, every single time we teach our membership classes. And so this is not kind of like 30,000 foot theology. This is very ground level stuff. The first question that we have to ask is what is the church? What is the church? If you ask people that question, you will get tons of different answers. It's a building. It's a program. It is preaching and singing songs on Sunday morning. Um, it's a political action group. It's a social club. There are just so many different definitions of the church. There's so much confusion and disagreement about what it actually is. Um, and, and you have to realize that it's not just that most Christians haven't really thought about that subject in depth. Most Christian leaders haven't thought about that subject in depth. There's almost no seminaries um, worldwide that have an actual class on the church. You'll cover it in systematic theology. You'll get one chapter in one book that might be one part of one discussion over 10 chapters in a week. That's it. And, and, and then we wonder why churches are struggling so much. It's because nobody even taught the leaders what a church is. And so in the Bible, the Greek word ekklesia is most often translated church. It means you know, gather one, set apart one's congregation, assembly. All, all words have a range of meaning. Never let anybody tell you the Greek word means this. No word means that. Um, it has a range of meaning. English words have a range of meaning, and so do Greek words. But that's a range of meaning. And, uh, and so that's who we're talking about, is we're talking about this gathered group of people, this assembly, this called out group, 
uh, of God's people. And so that begs the next question. Who are God's people? Well, when you, when you look at the New Testament, one of the things that Paul writes to Titus is, is found in Titus 2.14. Paul writes to Titus that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So the phrase I want you to hone in on there, especially because you're just listening, is a people for his own possession. That's, that's been God's plan, his unwavering commitment throughout human history is to purify a people for his own possession. So if you then look at Ephesians 1, you find this verse, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Listen to this even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Phrase I want you to think about right there is, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So remember, what's God's goal? Purify a people for his own possession. How did he do that? Well, he chose a people before the foundation of the world, right? Before anybody was born, before anybody had done anything good or evil, before anybody had a chance to earn that choosing, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And so what we, ref what we find recorded in the Bible then is essentially the story of how that gets worked out, okay? So you have, you know, if you, in biblical theology terms, you have the four main themes that you find in scripture. Creation, Fall, redemption, and new creation. Okay. So with creation, uh, you guys were just talking about Genesis 1 and 2 tonight, I gather. And so you've already covered a lot of that. So I'm not going to repeat too much there. But the story begins with God creating all things, including people, in his own image. He created Adam and Eve to know him and enjoy him forever, right? But sadly, the, the first people, Adam and Eve, rebelled against God. They fell into sin. And the irony of that whole thing is that Satan's temptation centered around this idea that God did not want them to eat the fruit because if they did, they would be like him. Well, they were already like him. They were created according to Genesis 1 and 2 in his image and likeness, right? So Satan starts off right away with lying, distorting God's words, twisting the truth. And so Adam and Eve buy into these lies. They rebel against God and they die spiritually. But God promised that he would send a redeemer. He would send one who would crush the head of the serpent. And so then from that point forward, from Genesis 3 forward, is the rest of the story of how God is going to send that redeemer. So you have again and again kind of two parallel things in the scripture. You have God's people whom God is revealing himself to, and the people are promising to obey God and to follow God and to keep his commands, and then falling into idolatry and sin, being disciplined by God, being repentant and being restored, and then promising never to do it again. And then they just do it again and again and again, right? Every time that cycle repeats itself, when they get to that low point of God's discipline, you have, and it's some of the high points too, you have God coming in through the prophets and promising that he is going to send the Redeemer. He's going to send uh, the one who is like David. Right? He's going to sit on his throne forever. You have the one that Isaiah says is going to be the wonderful counselor, almighty God, everlasting father, all of those things, right? You have the specifics of he's going to be born in Bethlehem. He's going to be born of a virgin. All of those things begin to unfold until we come to the time of John the Baptist and then him preaching this repentance because Jesus, the Savior, has come into the world. And so then, we, as we know, Jesus lived this sinless and miraculous life. He did not come to abolish the law, right? He came to fulfill the law. And he did so, and then he offered himself in our place and for our sins on the cross. He died, and on the third day, he rose from the grave victorious. And then John, you know, kind of sums it up by saying that to any who received him, to them, God gave the right to be called children of God. And so you have the, the redemptive work of Christ. And then after that, we have the new creation, which is the fourth and final biblical theological category, where Jesus is promising in his ministry that he's going to return again. All the apostles promising that Jesus is going to return again, and all things are going to be made new. So this time, Jesus is not coming as the suffering servant. He's coming as the conquering king, right? 
and he comes as the conquering king. And, and we read in Revelation 21 that John saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth have passed away. There's no more mourning or crying or tears anymore because God has made all things new and the former things have passed away. And so every person then who has repented of their sin and who has trusted in the gospel is going to spend eternity in heaven. Every, every single person who's not repented of sin and trusted in the gospel is going to spend eternity in hell. That is the reality that we find in the scripture. And so let's go back to the question now, who are God's people? God's people are all of those who have responded to God and his word with repentance and faith throughout history. So that would include Abraham and Moses and David and Isaiah and John the Baptist that would include all of the apostles. That would include every believer from them, from that day to this day. It is every person who has responded with faith to God and his word. That's an important definition because if you don't have that specific definition, that's where people get tripped up. Are Old Testament believers in heaven? You know, are, are, are they saved? Well, yes, because they are, they are under that same definition, right? God's people are all of those who responded to God and his word with repentance and faith. And so Abraham is in heaven. We actually just covered uh, the, the parable of, of the rich man and Lazarus a few weeks ago. And you see Abraham, you know, there uh, in comfort in heaven, so to speak, in that parable. Uh, and, and so that's who God's people are. So that, that's who comprises the universal church, as we would call it. The universal church is all of God's people for all times, living and dead. That's the universal church. It's invisible, right? We can't see all of the people even in the world today who are believers. We certainly can't see those who are dead. Uh, and so the universal church is all of God's people for all time, living and dead. Okay? That takes us to the next, the next distinction. So we talk, that, that's what the universal church is. That's who God's people are. But, but then what about the local church? That's the next distinction. We talked about the universal church. Now we've got to break it down to the local church. So a lot of people think when they read the Bible, the New Testament, that when the, the word church is used, that it's almost always talking about all of God's people everywhere, the universal church. That's not true. In more than 95% of occurrences in the New Testament, anytime the word church is used, it is referring to a specific, local, flesh and blood gathering of God's people. It's not referring to the universal church. That doesn't mean the universal church is unimportant. It just means that the emphasis in the New Testament is on the visible, tangible expression of the universal church, which is the local church. So I want you to think about a few examples with me in Scripture where we see this. You might think that we don't see the church until the book of Acts or until the epistles. But really, we see the word church mentioned for the first time in the Gospels in Matthew chapter 18, the famous passage on church discipline. <laughs> Jesus says, if you have someone who is in sin, what are you supposed to do? You go to them, and you tell them their sin, right? If they don't listen, you take two or three along with you. And then if they don't listen to the two or three, what do you do? You tell it to the church. Well, from the context, brothers, there's no way for that to mean the universal church. How would you tell that to people who are dead? How would you tell that to people who are in Africa or Asia or South America or, you know, wherever? You couldn't do it. It assumes the local church. It assumes a flesh and blood local gathering of people. So we see it first in Matthew 18. Then think about the entire trajectory of the book of Acts. Okay? In the book of Acts, the apostles don't travel to a region, preach the gospel, see people saved and baptized, and then go, good luck. In every instance, they organize the new believers into local churches with recognized elders. Think about Acts chapter 14. This is, this is a passage from Acts 14. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Now listen to this. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting they committed them to the Lord in whom they believed. So you don't have these disorganized, random groups of believers just left to themselves after Paul preaches the gospel, sees them come to faith, and sees them baptized. No, he organizes them into local churches and sees, even if he's not the one directly appointing in every instance, he makes sure, as he tells Titus, right, to, 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 to find these elders, 
you make sure that there's elders appointed in every church so that there's order and leadership given to the local churches. With few exceptions, every single letter in the New Testament is written to a local church or to a group of churches, a group of local churches, right? There's very few that are kind of general epistles. Those are at the back of the New Testament, as you know. Almost every other one, Romans, is written to the church in Rome. Corinthians, first and second, written to the, that specific church. Galatians, to those, the churches in that region. Colossae, Philippi, right? Ephesus. These are all specific local churches, and that's what the New Testament has in mind. And so what is the local church? The local church, as we said, is a visible tangible expression of the universal church. That's what it is. And so without local expressions of the universal church, brothers, we simply can't obey most of the commands found in the New Testament. There's no context for them. Obey your, obey your elders and submit to them. Who? All of them in the world? Any ones I choose? The ones that I feel like today? They're your, obey your leaders, obey your elders and submit to them for they're keeping watch over your souls and they have to give an account to God, right? So those commands, that's just one example, those commands are impossible to obey without a robust understanding of the local church and therefore membership also in the local church. Let me, uh, let me pause there and just ask if there's any questions real briefly. Anything that I've said so far raise any questions or observations for you? Is the, uh, I do have a question. Uh, I was thinking what you said about the letters, the epistles, and, mm -hmm. uh, the, how we picture church as a gathering of you know, believers yeah. and people would say. Um, does that imply like the picture we have now, a larger mm -hmm. gathering of people, mm -hmm. of, or can it be, like I have a, as I read uh, the New Testament, I have this picture actually a local church as gathering in homes. Yeah. Um, oh, the, 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 the church, no church had a church building for about 300 years. Right. So the New Testament is only speaking of house churches. Okay. They didn't have options, right? I mean, they, they, they were dependent on people opening their homes because where were they going to go? I mean, there were no church buildings. There was, there was very few people in society that would have allowed them to meet in their facilities. And so certainly, uh, the New Testament has in mind a, a gathering of God's people. And we're going to talk in just a minute about what makes something a church. That's the next topic. And see, it's like you're thinking through this clearly because the next question in your mind was, what's, what's a church then? What's a local church? How do you know if something is a real church? And we're going to cover that next. But certainly, no, it, <clears throat> the New Testament uh, does not exclude by any means even mega churches. But it did not necessarily have those in mind as Paul is writing. I mean, Paul is writing to very small groups of people, generally speaking. Some of the churches were larger. The Corinthian church, we're about to start 1 Corinthians this week at New Life. Uh, the Corinthian church was large, you know. But uh, the Jerusalem church, right, it was very large. 3,000 added to their number in one day. <laughs> they had a mega church on Pentecost. <laughs> that quick. It's easy. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Writing to this guy, but he yeah. he talks about the church that meets in his. Sure, house. the John's letters too. I mean, Second and Third John. I mean, seem to be written to, to house churches, right? And into, into those that are that, that are opening their homes for the for the few believers who are there, right? Yeah, I think that was the common model in the New Testament. You'll probably get this from going to the next part, but I think the thing I thought this for several years. The thing that we missed that they had is the sense of community that they had. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, it's like that. Oh, Chris, we're a commuter church. You've got two couples that live behind the church. Mm -hmm. Everybody else drives there. Mm -hmm. How do you get a community with that? Uh, it's much harder yes. to have it. So theirs, theirs was kind of automatic. Because mm -hmm. they had house church. They all knew each other. Yep. They worked with each other and all this stuff. So yep. I think they were way more closer mm -hmm. to the body than sure. what we are. In some ways, definitely. And you have to understand, this is an ancient context, which meant there was no cars, no planes. Everything had to be walkable in a community. So everybody, and these are houses that, you know, if you've seen architectural, or uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? 
Well, just, you know, when they've dug up these sites, I mean, the houses are on top of each other, literally. I mean, they're, you know, they're the size of this room right next to each other, hundreds in a row, and they're stacked up. The only modern equivalent is mega cities. New York City, Rio, Tokyo, Beijing, that's what it's like. So that's where, you know, um, some of these other books, Total Church, for example, they're in England, in London, and when you start to think about those kinds of contexts, you know, it, it's very helpful to have different perspectives from big cities because things that will work in the inner city don't work in suburban contexts and things that work in suburban contexts don't necessarily work in the inner city. Those are good questions. Well, let's, since it's, a lot of those are anticipatory, let's get to the next section. So there are so many things that claim to be local churches, right? So in our community, we've got several Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Several Mormon churches. The church is in the name. Are they a church? The Jehovah's Witnesses, they, they say they're going to church on Sundays. Are they a church? Westboro Baptist Church has church in its name. Is that a church? No, that's a political action group, right? Just because something's called a church doesn't make it a church. And so the question is, what is, how do you distinguish? What, what, what does the Bible tell us is a true church? Well, historically, there's three marks of a true church. First mark is faithful preaching of the word. Faithful preaching of the word. Paul talks in Romans chapter 10 in that section. How will then they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And I'll skip to the last verse here because this is what I want you to focus on. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Where does faith come from? Hearing. Where does hearing come from? Through the word of Christ. You cannot have a true church without faithful preaching of the word. Faithful preaching of the word is the linchpin for everything else. Because when you have the word faithfully preached, you have the gospel clearly proclaimed. Well, the only way that people become a part of the universal church, right? how do they become part of God's people? The universal church is all those who have responded to God's to God and his word with repentance and faith, right? Well, then they have to hear the word, right? They have to repent and believe. Well, th without the faithful preaching of the word, people aren't going to repent and believe because faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So the linchpin of the whole thing of a true church is faithful preaching of the word. Why, are the, why is the Mormon church not a true church? Because they don't faithfully preach the word. They say that the Bible is fine, it's a nice supplemental text, but it's been corrupted, and the church has been corrupted, so we need the new revelation of Joseph Smith from the 19th century. Look at that. Right, not really. Now, I've got a, what they call a quad, and it has all three of their books, and then it has this yep. front, mm -hmm. which I thought was odd. I'm like, why would they make this yeah. quad if the church does yeah. print? Mm -hmm. It's a King James Version. And Naturally, so in, in the front, it's a real King James version. Mm -hmm. They haven't modified it or whatever. Yeah. But I'm like, but they don't read it. Mm -hmm. They don't touch it. Right. You know, since they're told it was corrupted. Yes, that's right. You know, and all of that. It's like you say, but yep. Yeah, which obviously goes against the things that the Bible actually says about itself. Like the apostles are very clear that the Word of God cannot fail. Well, the Scripture cannot be broken. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. Right. Whereas you look at their scriptures, sure. they contradict each other all over the place. Exactly right. So the faithful preaching of the word rules out the Mormon church, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Westboro Baptist Church, all of these entities that claim to be true churches because they don't faithfully preach the word, right? So there's not the true gospel being proclaimed, and therefore God can't, can't purify people for his own possession because how do people become God's people? Through hearing the word and responding to it with repentance and faith. Okay, so that's the first mark, faithful preaching of the word. Second mark of a true church is faithful administration of the ordinances, which are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Faithful administration of the ordinances, which are baptism and the Lord's Supper. So the word ordinance means a, a command. These are the things that Christ commanded us to do. 
And so in the Great Commission, he commands us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that he has commanded us, right? So baptism is an ordinance. It's not a suggestion. It's not a step for really mature Christians. Um, it's not kind of a commemorative experience. It is a command of Jesus. And all true Christians and all true churches agree about that. Now, our Presbyterian brothers, our Methodist brothers, uh, our Episcopalian brothers, uh, they disagree about baptism, right? They, they would say that baptism it should be applied to infants because it's a direct replacement for the covenant of circumcision. Okay, they're not a false church because of that, okay? They, they are going to agree with us that baptism is an ordinance. It's required, a command. We disagree about whether they're applying it rightly, but they would nevertheless completely agree with us that it's a command of Jesus. So that's the front door, right? Baptism is the front door. That's where we declare, this is what God has done in my life through Christ, and you are making this public profession of faith that you have died with Christ, you have been buried with Christ, and you've been raised to walk in new life with Christ. That's baptism. I don't know. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I just I listened because I was because uh, I listened to some Presbyterians, uh, you know, like RC Sproul and sure. stuff like that, and uh, so that was something that I was interested in was the the dichotomy I guess between infant baptism and believers baptism. Yep. So anyway, I listened to a debate between RC Sproul and John MacArthur, uh -huh. and it was very enlightening. Mm -hmm. You know, what I mean, like it was yep. it was something that, and I just found it on YouTube. So yeah, it, yeah, it was something. And and RC did say that they do. Believers' baptism at his church, whatever the name of it is, Westminster or something like that. Yeah. Before, yeah. But that mm. you know there was a difference between the what they do for infants and then a believers' baptism. Right. Yeah, that's true. Yep. And uh, I mean, yeah. So. The, the thing with, with an R.C. Sproul or, or any of our Presbyterian brothers, I mean, is, is going to be they, they have biblical reasons for why they practice baptism that way. You know, I disagree with them. I don't find them compelling, but, but they have biblical reasons. It's still, they're a true church. They're practicing baptism as a command of Christ. The Lord's Supper, then, is the second ordinance, right? And so Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, commanded us to remember him in this way, right? Every time we, we remember, we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes, as Paul says. And so um, we've been commanded that by Christ, and that's been backed up by Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians. And so if, if baptism is, is the initial uh, rite of passage, so to speak, into the Christian life, the, the, the symbol of our initial repentance and faith, well, the Lord's Supper is, is symbolic of our ongoing repentance and faith, right? Every time we take the Lord's Supper, we are freshly meditating on the gospel, freshly trusting in Christ. We are examining our hearts and confessing sins to God and to each other if there's problems, right? Because what does the Lord's Supper represent? It represents that we are living in an ongoing, repentant way before God and others because it symbolizes the unity that we have in Christ with God and in Christ with each other. So there's horizontal and vertical dimensions to the Lord's Supper. So it too is an ordinance. And so no church... Ha the scriptures don't tell us this is how often you need to practice the Lord's Supper. No matter what you hear on the radio from the BCS Church of Christ, right? There is no specific command that you must do it. It is as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. But it is not up for debate that you must observe the Lord's Supper, okay? So we practice it weekly. Other churches practice it monthly or quarterly. What's not up for debate is that you practice it. So any true church must be practicing baptism, as the initial rite of passage into the Christian life that Jesus has given to us. And then any church that is a true church is going to be practicing the Lord's Supper, the symbol of ongoing fellowship with God and with each other. And then third and finally, last mark of a true church is faithful administration of church discipline. Faithful administration of church discipline. So Jesus is very clear in Matthew chapter 18. We don't have a choice about church discipline. He's very clear. If there is someone who professes to be a believer who is living in unrepentant sin, we must go to him and call him to repent. If he listens to us, then what does the text say? We have gained our brother. The, the whole goal is not embarrassment, shame, punishment. The whole goal is restoration. We're going to gain our brother back, right? If he doesn't listen to us, we take two or three witnesses along with us. People get tripped up with that word witnesses. They say, well, what if I didn't have two or three? What if I was the only person that saw the sin? 
Well, let's think about this for a second. What, what if you know that a brother's committed adultery? How many people saw that? Hopefully zero, other than him and her, right? That would be very weird if other people were watching that. Witnesses is not referring to witnesses of the sin. Witnesses are referring to witnesses of the biblical process of church discipline. They are going along with you to establish that you three have gone together to call the sinning brother to repentance and that you have sought to win him, to restore him to repentance and faith and fellowship with God and the church. That's why they're called witnesses. If they don't listen to the, the, the three of you, what do you do? You tell it to the... Not the elders, not the pastors, not the staff. You tell it to the church. Now, those other people might be involved in that process at some level and probably should be. But the third step is you tell it to the church. The church ultimately is involved in the discipline. The elders, the pastors, the staff, any one particular person does not have the authority biblically to discipline and finally excommunicating someone from the church. Only the church carries that authority together. And so then if he doesn't even listen to the church, Jesus says, let him be to you as a Gentile or tax collector. You remove him from the fellowship and you treat him as though he is a non-Christian. You're not passing judgment on his soul, saying he is definitely lost and definitely going to hell. You are saying to that man, brother, you might be professing to be a Christian, but you are living in unrepentant sin. And Christians are repentant sinners. Therefore, you do not meet the definition of a Christian. So we will be treating you from now on like a non-Christian because that's how you're acting. Does that make sense? Yeah. So faithful administration of church discipline is going to be that, that final mark of a true church. Now, a healthy church, which is what we're going to talk about to, to kind of close out our time together in the last 20 minutes here, that's a different thing. A church can be true and unhealthy. There's tons of them. But these are the three marks that make a true church. So let me pause there, and, and we'll take a couple questions, and then we'll, we'll get into the healthy stuff, and then we'll do some more questions at the end. Questions about any three of those marks of a true church. Just a couple of thoughts on that. When you take the two witnesses with you, I think the other thing that's doing, it's also holding the person who's bringing the charges accountable as well. Absolutely. Because yep. those two or three witnesses might say, hey, listen, you're blowing this out of proportion. This is, one, this is one of those things where, where, where love covers a multitude Correct. of sins. And, and it helps you sort of check your own attitude. Yes. You're bringing other people into the picture. And the other thing that just... If I can pause you there, Steve, real quick. Yeah. And then you, you, you talk about church leaders. What does Paul say about the charges that are brought against church leaders? Only, only receive them if they're brought by two or three witnesses, right? Because you don't want any kind of slanderous charges by one unhappy person to derail a ministry. Right. And then I'm just saying also, and that treating them like an un unbeliever is, I think, I think churches need to do a better job of thinking about what that looks like. Right. Uh, it's not, it's not shunning yeah. like mm -hmm. what we think. We will never that, ever talk to you again. Right. It's not like the, in the Amish, you're, you're out of the community yep. now. Yeah. It's how would you, hopefully any church treat any unbeliever in your mm -hmm. neighborhood, you're going to love on them, yep. you're going to evangelize them, you're going to. You're going to try to reach them through, yep. uh, through, yep. through preaching the gospel to them, but also showing mm -hmm. the gospel-centered life to them. Yep. So you do the same, you still love on this person, yep. but there's obviously certain aspects of the church life yep. that they're no longer. Uh, and especially the Lord's Supper, right? We have to bar them from taking the Lord's Supper because who is the Lord's Supper for? It's for repentant sinners. Anyone who is a repentant sinner is welcome to take the Lord's Supper. We have fellowship with God and with each other because we are repentant sinners reconciled through Christ. But we can't administer the Lord's Supper to those who are not right with God and not right with others because of their sin. Right. Is there any way to really enforce that? <laughs> I mean, I know that sounds odd, but so say that we are treating this person. Mm -hmm. They're still, okay, so they're still coming to fellowship. We've put them out of fellowship or whatever we're yep. treating them as they're an unbeliever uh -huh. but they're still coming to services uh -huh. okay and if if your situation with the Lord's mm -hmm. Supper is like passing of a plate right 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 then I mean is the yeah. usher going to come and tackle him if he yeah. tries to I, I, I would think not I mean you see what I'm, yeah you see what I'm well saying? it goes back to Hector you know Hector was talking earlier about house churches right like the smaller the fellowship, the less likely that is to occur. And I'll tell you, I mean, we're, we're a fairly large church. I mean, 500 plus in attendance. We've never had anyone under church discipline return. 
Right. So well, I mean, yeah, in people are embarrassed and they're not going to come back. But right. If you have yeah. Somebody that's like, well, and I would say even more so than embarrassed. I mean, I think I think when you when you carry out the process properly. You have communicated to them these these things, and there there's an understanding there that we are not in fellowship because of their decisions and lifestyle. And so, in our experience, there's not really been a disagreement about where things stand. You know, um, they, they there's not really even been like fighting or pushback about why we've excommunicated them. They would almost agree with us that according to our standard, they should be excommunicated. But most of the time, they're saying, "I don't care what that book says." That's that's the problem is that they've said that so so they're throwing off all that rare is the person who says I really care about what that book says and I'm living in unrepented sin right. and I'm showing up on you know like that is just well, it's almost like your guy if he'd actually said oh, I'm I'm going to hire these people because of these other doctrinal reasons or something if that had been the discussion and trying to go to scripture the response would have been totally different mm. than the response that was well gee I just like making money this way right yep. For, for yep. So another question: What do you do then after the fact? Like you have an unrepentant mm -hmm. person in the church, you talk to them, and then you, yep. you, know, you let them know you're going to turn mm -hmm. out unbelievers. Yeah. They decide to go away, mm -hmm. they go somewhere else. What yeah. do you do as a pastor? Uh -huh. Do you have to communicate that with the next church? One hundred percent. If if we can trace that down, if we have any idea or inkling, if we hear anything, we are one hundred percent, and we have every single time contacted any other church leaders and told them, you need to know that this person professes to be a believer. They were a member at our church and they were removed from membership and fellowship because of X, Y, Z. And we don't necessarily divulge all the details, but just we're going to tell they are under church discipline. And we have had churches write us back and say, thank you so much. We are, we're so glad to hear that. And we've had churches ignore us completely and, and do nothing. And, and I know at least one case where there's a person that uh, had, had an adulterous affair, got, got an unbiblical divorce. We excommunicated them. And uh, they, they went to one church in town. We told them about the situation. They also affirmed our disciplinary procedures. They went to another church, and they were a member of that church within a few weeks. I mean, there's only so much you can do, right? Unless right. everybody is in this together, right. and this is our standard. And then, Morgan, uh, so real quick, I, I would love to see uh, associations become what they meant to be, were meant back in the 1700s, and hold each other accountable doctrinally, mm -hmm. and to where, as an association, we agree yes. to standards of discipline, that right. we can say, listen, if this person goes from church to church in the association, and they're out of fellowship with one of our association churches, we, we do not... We, we, we encourage them to go and be reconciled. Yes. We encourage them to go repent of right. sin and be reconciled. We don't just bring them into our body to pat our numbers. Under the auspices of love. you right. know, Like that was the whole problem in 1 Corinthians 5, which is a church discipline chapter, right? They're saying like how loving and affirming they're being of this guy sleeping with his stepmom. And Paul is like, expel the immoral brother. What's wrong with you? You know, this, the boasting thing about your love. I'm sorry. I was actually a member of a church in Nashville for a while. Like last part of the time I was there, and uh, they actually uh, it was really odd. They're opposite everybody else. They would have a hundred in attendance, but only fifty were members. That's good. So it's totally opposite. Yeah, but that's what you but want to become a member, though. I mean, it was laid out. They got a document. Yep. And plus two, you were interviewed for membership. Mm -hmm. yep. They want to know your conversion experience. Yep. They want to explain it to you and all that. And yep. It was all really good. I thought it was awesome. But one of the expectations is, you know, unless you're sick or you're out of town, mm -hmm. they expect you to be at church every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And we had a person that for six months just didn't go. Mm -hmm. So for six months after that, the pastor and the elders, you know, went and had conversations yep. and stuff. And finally, when it got to the church body, mm -hmm. when it got to us, we had a folder about like that. Mm -hmm. We documented everything, wrote it all down, and yep. all that kind of stuff. Right. And then we voted to excommunicate. Yeah, it. you have to. And we did. And I mean, it's all biblical. They yeah, all chapter and verse, right? Everything. Yeah. And I, yep. You know, that's just good. And so that's right. You know, churches where you have yeah a thousand elder membership role and eighty seven in attendance. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think yeah, it's totally backwards. I think this is probably rare, but this did happen one time in my church experience, and that was that we got a call that a person visiting our church had been excommunicated from their church, and I was thankful. We and I actually went and met with the pastor, but the more I investigated, I realized it was actually a situation of 
of an, a domineering pastor. The, the situation was simply the member disagreed with the pastor about something and it shared his thoughts on it. And next thing he knows, he's being voted out and, and it wasn't at all biblical grounds for discipline. So we ended up accepting that family in. We, we still encouraged him to be reconciled right. to his former pastor and, and to seek her, do all he could be. At, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. That's right. right. And, but it was a situation where there was pastoral abuse on the other side yeah. of that discipline. So I think be aware of that as well. And you, it's your job, though, as a shepherd to care for these folks and to investigate this to the best of That's what I'm saying. I think it was good because it took them six months to get to the point to get it to the church. That means they got mm -hmm. every opportunity. Yep. Right. That's, that. Yeah, very good. Instead of just saying, oh, a, month, nope. a week later, you're, you're gone. No. Yeah, and we can talk. We can talk more about the specifics of discipline in a minute. Let me. Can I get back and then pause at the end, Carl, and no, we'll talk? Okay. Um, let's uh, let's let's talk about then. So we, we we establish what's a true church, okay, from a false church. Those three marks. But what makes something a healthy church, right? Because you can be a true church and an unhealthy church. And so this is what you guys have been reading in Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. And so what I want to do is highlight the marks that we're not going to cover in the next couple of weeks, either tonight or week two or week three. And so um, I'm just going to kind of run through this list um, for about 15 minutes here and, and kind of give you some thoughts on, on each one of these. And then, uh, and then we can have some conversation. I can hang out and we can talk some more. Uh, first mark of a healthy church is expositional preaching. So you can have a church that faithfully preaches the Word of God. They are a true church that does not preach expositionally. So what is expositional preaching? It's where the point of the sermon comes directly from the point of the passage being preached. Okay? There is a book out there that I read um, in seminary called Why Johnny Can't Preach. It is a fantastic read. And the author says that um, in, his, in his experience, his wife's experience, of all of the sermons that they've ever heard, 10% had a discernible point. They could walk out of the service and say, the sermon was about this. 10%. One out of 10 sermons, they could actually say, this was the point of the sermon. That's awful. They said of that 10%, only 10% of those sermons was the point based on the text being preached. Expositional preaching does not necessarily mean that you are going verse by verse through books of the Bible. That's the most common form of expositional preaching. But what expositional preaching means is that the point of the text, the, the, the inspired point of the text, is the point of the sermon, right? So, the story of David and Goliath, right? People preach that all the time. It's a story about courage and standing up to your enemies. No, it's not. That's not at all what David and Goliath is. David and Goliath is a story about the glory of God being displayed through the weakness of man and his desire to preserve a people for his own glory. That is what David and Goliath is about. And anyone who says that it's a story of courage and heroism and standing up to bullies and stuff like that, that's all fine. That's just not the point of that text. They've missed it. Jesus and the feeding of the 5,000, right? Children's ministries all over the world teach that as a great story to teach kids how to share because the little boy shared his loaves and his fish and so we too should be sharing and generous. That is not the point of that text. It's great to teach kids to share. I wish I could teach my kids to share. The point of that passage is Jesus is God. <laughs> That's the point of that passage. He alone can multiply the loaves and fishes. He can do anything. He can forgive sins, right? And so expositional preaching is critical because it is rightly dividing the Word of God. And if you're not rightly dividing the Word of God, you're leading your people, at least if not astray, you're leading your people wrongly to wrong conclusions about God and themselves. And here's the other thing. I will advocate for verse-by-verse -verse preaching through books of the Bible being the main diet of the church. Here's why. Topical preaching, 99% of the time, requires a very gifted, very creative man who teaches people to come to him to solve the riddle of this very confusing book and jump all over it to find verses that make sense of a point that he wants to say. He can also conveniently skip any passage that he doesn't like that he disagrees with, that he finds difficult. When you preach verse by verse through books of the Bible, you cannot skip hard stuff, you can't skip passages that make you uncomfortable, 
and you're teaching people to study the Word of God. The greatest compliment that I receive as a preacher is when people occasionally come up to me and say, Alan, um, this morning, it seemed like all you did was read the text, explain it, and then apply it. Right. It's not rocket science. You can do this. <laughs> And that's what I want them to walk away with. I want them walking away feeling empowered by the Spirit of God and the grace of God to open this book and study it for themselves and come to the right conclusions. You don't need some guy standing up there with an untucked shirt and a cool haircut and three cool points and flashy slides. You don't need any of that stuff. Right? Expositional preaching is the, the, the first mark of a healthy church. Second mark is biblical theology. Biblical theology. People underestimate how important theology is to the life of the church. And you'll hear people all the time say things like, you know, I don't want to talk about theology. Theology divides. I just want to talk about Jesus. Okay. Um, who is Jesus? As soon as you answer that question, Jesus was a sinless man who was born of a virgin, who did many miraculous signs, who claimed to be the son of God. You are, this is all theology, right? All of that is theology. There is no escaping theology. We are all theologians. You're either a biblical theologian or you're an unbiblical theologian. Those are the only distinctions. An atheist is a theologian. An agnostic is a theologian. So any healthy church is filled with biblical theologians. And so what we want to do is teach people to derive theology from the right understanding of texts that is modeled every Sunday morning when we preach our sermons. I want them to go home and do their own Bible study over the same book or a different book. And I want them to, to open the scripture and I want them to come to biblical conclusions about what the Bible teaches because they've simply opened the word and understood it in context, right? And so biblical theology helps us in so many ways. But I would say that, you know, one of, the, one of the greatest ways that biblical theology helps us is it helps us to have a right view of God and a right view of ourselves. And so Steve said I could write on the board, and so I'm going to do that very thing. So what I want you guys to, to see with biblical theology here is that what it does primarily is, is those two things. So I'm going to say right view of God and ourselves. And the reason that I write it that way is because I think that diagram is really helpful. I did not come up with this, but this is, this is really important. When you are lost, your conception of God and your conception of you is basically the same thing, okay? Uh, you don't see God as very holy. You don't see yourself as very sinful. You see God as kind of maybe different than you, but he doesn't really have authority over your life. What happens is that as you come into contact with the Bible and Jesus and Christian theology, you begin to realize that, in fact, God is holy, and you, in fact, are sinful. This gap becomes a problem, right? Well, how is that gap going to be filled? Well, for some people, works, right? Religion? Well, we would say the gospel. Right? No.